I'm Steve Monkey Mason and welcome to Branching Out. This is episode two and I have the one and only Mitch Laddie on the line. How we doing, you alright? I'm good, how are you? Ah, not too bad at all, not too bad, given, given the circumstances. Yeah, well, a couple of questions, I've got a few, I've been thinking about these, but um, get to the story how we met. Um, how young were you when you started picking up a guitar? Because not many people can play the guitar like you. <laughs> Cheers, man. Um, well, I picked it up really young, uh, probably about three, something like that. But it was kind of always like small guitars, or like toy, obviously started with a toy guitar, and then I got a classical. I think when I was about four, uh, and it just it just went from there. I play, I tried to play a little bit, but then as a kid, obviously you get distracted and stuff. I uh, just ended up getting sucked into football and, then, and sports and whatnot and uh, I didn't pick it up properly again until I was about 11 and uh, yeah so a long time <laughs> 29 now so 11 I would say so like I remember because there is a there's a bit of an age gap between us now that's never affected our friendship because when we met we just clicked um, but obviously growing up um, I, I don't know if you know actually know this story I'm sure I've probably told you this but Obviously, in school, I was quite good friends with your cousin Kieran, and then yeah, I, yeah. I obviously know your other cousin Amy. She's been in a few of my videos. Um, Kieran was obviously a big part of filming when I was younger, and they were always on about this little cousin called Mitch. And then, funny enough, um, my granddad of all people had got this DVD going around, and it was you. I think it's when you first met Walter, and you were playing away or something live, and like even right, like yeah. the old older generation were like oh look to check this kid check this wizard out and I was like it's that fucking Mitch laddie and that's before I even <laughs> met you but not yeah it was just like but again it came to the point where we met in the union didn't we and then um I think I met you in passing and um, when Dr Lipship was recording but um it wasn't I think it was the second union gig um it just clicked then like in the that's the origins of that friendship and the drunken nights like, but definitely. Um, so you got you were um, quite young when you first started getting the band together, and the band was called Vanilla Moon, wasn't it? That's right. Terrible name for a band. Um, yeah, I, I would have been about fourteen when we first when we first started all that, and it was like it was a four piece with another guitarist, uh, and then yeah, we just we just. Did a lot of covers of stuff we liked and uh, wrote mad prog music. <laughs> I think you've already got. Do you only record free tracks? I've got a free track EP of yours. Um, I think we did in total. We did about four different recordings, but I don't know where they all are. I think one of them we didn't end up using. Um, it was kind of just we used it as demos for stuff that we were doing. Uh, I, I remember we set up like a crazy multi-core like uh studio where we were recording downstairs my dad at the time was living in a uh, he's living like a three-story town townhouse kind of thing with a bedroom on the bottom floor and he went upstairs to go to the living room and they were in uh him and a couple of his mates were like recording with a desk and whatnot uh upstairs and they ran all the, the multi-core downstairs and just like used our pa at the time to record a demo but i'd say probably about I think there's two proper CDs that we did, but I can't remember which order they come. So, which which one have you got? Oh, I don't know. Just three tracks on my computer. Um, be buried. I'm sure it had a white and black cover. Ah, uh, I mean, that would be like the last one we did, I think. Again, that's through like passing when Doctor Lipship, because you you guys used to practice in the turf as well, haven't you? We did, yeah. We spent all of our uh, all of our youth every Wednesday, every Saturday. Sorry, every Wednesday, every Sunday, and uh, whatever gigs we did there, uh, just in there writing and practicing. Yeah, luckily, uh, my dad was really good mates with Trev. Uh, he's sadly no longer with us, um, but he's a great guy. He's his best mate, and at the time he had the pub, Trevor and Christina. So they gave us a massive opportunity to kind of let stuff naturally blossom and stuff. So we owe a lot to them. I guess you. Uh took a uh, guitar over driving lessons didn't you <laughs> i'd forgotten about that but i had uh, <laughs> so what i ended up, that was it when i was when i was 18 my mom said you can either have driving lessons 
or a new guitar. And naturally, I got a new guitar. So, and then dri- driving came about six years later. <laughs> Been a while. So, what is your favourite guitar you've got then? What's your prime, um, prime prejudice one? Oh, it's, it's it's hard because I've got one. I've got a couple of little, I've got a couple of strats that are, I suppose, nearly well, the vintage now. They're like 30 year old guitars. Um, I've got an 89 Japanese strat, which is the first strat I ever bought. Um, and I've done a lot of modifications to and stuff. Uh, it's not my favourite to play, but I would never get rid of it. So it holds a lot of sentimental value. And then I've got an 89 uh, Strat Plus USA one that was that was given to us by my dad. So that's kind of got like a, a bit of a thing uh, because of because I grew up around it. Uh, my dad had it when I was a kid, so I, I, it's all, it's something that I always remember. If that makes sense. Um, but my all out favourite guitar would have to be me uh, me white me white Eric Johnson Stratocaster, just because of. I got it at that time where I really started, like, getting serious about everything and throwing a lot of love into it, and it's been everywhere with the sod. I'd say that one. That's me go to. I know uh, Michael Jackson and Prince were massive influences, yeah. But like, how did you end up becoming like a blues band, especially with being so young? Because this is when Vanilla Moon faded out, and uh, it was Mitch Laddie f- first, wasn't it? Wasn't the Mitch Laddie band yet? So it was, we had Vanilla Moon, and then we had um, Mitch Laddie Trio. And then that kind of just, once we got signed, that ended up being just Mitch Laddie because uh, of the label that we were with. And that was what I was signed as. That's where it had to go out as. Um, and then it became Mitch Laddie Band. So it's it's been a bit of a, a bit of, uh, similar similar things, but just this kind of always like a, a separate thing which is kind of what I'm trying to do now the, the band stuff separate from the stuff that I'm doing because it's it's just so di- it's just so different uh, but yeah yeah a couple of different names I mean there's like blues I mean um, I mean there's definitely a Martin I mean obviously Joe Bonamass is probably the biggest at the moment everyone just seems to cream over his stuff but like this like a lot of young talent getting into blues though isn't it it's like uh, is it Ben Poole as well um, yeah. There's a lot of people out there doing blues, but you just don't see it that commercial, like mainstream. Uh, no, it's true. It's uh, it's weird in in Europe. It's got a it's got a much bigger following. It's like a much more of a thing. Uh, blues rock in, in places like Germany and Holland, and uh, but for myself, it was through Walter uh, and just growing up around it. Obviously, me me, me mom and dad listen listen to blues. Um, and me, me, a lot of my family listened to me, so I, I was brought up around it and obviously heard it a lot. My dad played guitar in, uh, in bands and stuff when I was a kid. And, yeah, I just kind of got sucked into it. Once I started playing, it was, it was kind of what I wanted to do. It just felt natural. Uh, but it's strange with the, with the blues thing now because I, I, what you're saying there about, like, young guys getting into it. I think when I got... Uh, when I came into the industry properly, which was through the help of Walter... Um, who my all loads, loads and loads and loads of gratitude towards because uh, if it wasn't for him, things would have been very different. Uh, but basically, with guys like Ben Poole, it was me, uh, Ollie Brown, uh, and that, then there was Lawrence Jones and stuff who came later. Virginly Accelerators. There was, there was there was a lot. There was quite a, quite a lot of us uh, growing up, like at that time. And I think it slowed down a bit more now I don't think there's as many new young blues guitarists uh, kind of on the, coming into the scene but I don't pay as much attention to, to that world as I used to but now nah, it's crazy it, it's 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 strange in the UK because the blues mar- like the blues markets uh, it's very clicky and I think that's why I kind of decided that I wasn't going to pour everything that I had uh, creatively into that as a an outlet because Ultimately, if if it's not blues, you know, for the most part, they don't like it. Which I guess it's the same with any genre, but it's it's very, you know, the word purist comes in a bit a bit too much, and it's this it's been a strange strange experience, kind of being part of something like that. Great experience, but strange at the same time. It was weird because when I came back from New Zealand, like uh, Walter's new album is on, like you know, the playlist where you can touch the screens. And you know you're flicking through, and like blues does transition right across. Like, but it's, 
I think in the UK it's fizzled down and like bands have got a tour. Really, I think. Absolutely. Super Son is this supersonic blues machine, and you get these bands that just like pop up. They're almost like super groups, you know what I mean, when they group together. Well, that's it. I, it's, um, with, with with stuff like that, it's the label that I was signed to originally uh, with through the help of Walter, which is Provo Mascot Provo Records, uh, and they like so supersonic blues machine and all that kind of thing. It's like they put kind of little super groups together every now and then of people on of guitarists on the roster. Yeah, people do collaborations and stuff. Yeah. But yeah, you did. Uh, so you had. Was it this time around? Was the first one? That was the first one. Yeah. That's um, that's you. Just, that's you yeah. outside. Um, I mean, you 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 got a bit of passion for Newcastle here because you're standing outside of uh, the courts, and the bridge, um, which would be on the front cover of Burning Bridges, is in the background, which is pretty cool. <laughs> no, I I, I guess uh, I've been wanting to kind of shy away from from the region that I was from and obviously being a big football fan as well I've got a lot of love for Newcastle but obviously as a place as well I think it's I do genuinely think it's one of the nicest uh, places in, in cities in the UK and I've been been around a bit so not just because I'm from here just, there's, there's, just a, there's just a nice vibe about the place and you don't always get that with other places so nah, like, like keep it real keeping it real the music scene and concerts have been up and down for a couple of years um, do you have any favourite venues in the past that are no longer here that's a, a strange one I suppose there's been a kind of few um, well there was obviously the union when the band nights were there that was, that was, pretty, that was pretty cool I, although I wouldn't have called it a, like a music venue <laughs> not at all <laughs> Still rubble. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, I haven't touched it. It's really weird, but now nah, I always enjoyed. Always enjoyed those. They they were pretty cool. Um, but yeah, I guess it's, it, it it is a shame because there's not as much going on. Hopefully, places like the you know like the turf can come out the other end of what's going on now and, and survive as well. Because it'd be a crying shame if not. Yeah, I mean it's for you yourself as well. It's great to see you doing all the live stuff as well. We've been in lockdown and. Just like a lot of like, as I say, when you you are a full time traveling, I, mean, I was going to call you a magician there, musician. Um, <laughs> I wish I was a magician. Um, obviously, you know what I mean. It's like this is what you do. This is your job, and you've you've toured all the way around. Now, while we're talking about your touring, can you tell me about this naked man? <laughs> I certainly can. I certainly can. Um, right, where were we? We were playing with Virgil and the Accelerators. And it would have been about 2012, something like that, 2012, 2013 at the most. Uh, and long story short, I think we were playing in High Wickham, and it used to be, it was like a converted uh, music venue from an old church, and the venue itself was really cool. Um, but I, I can't remember what the what the gig was for, what it was part of. Uh, but we ended up, it, it wasn't far from where we were staying at the time, because our driver lived in Oxford, so it wasn't a big deal for us, we didn't have to go too far. Um, so we went and we did it and it wasn't very busy but after the gig we were we, uh, we, we played first that night and we were at the merch table and we've been talking to a few people selling some CDs and whatnot and then I look over whilst watching the other band and I look over <laughs> and to me left I just see this guy sat down in amongst in amongst the other people as well he wasn't just on his own um and he was totally and utterly naked. <laughs> totally not, a, not, a, not a thing on. Like, shoes off, everything. Um, if I remember rightly, he had his clothes, like, neatly folded on top, in front of him, on the table. But, I, so I said to Matt, I said to Matt, you and I, and I was like, is it just me, or is that bloke completely and utterly stuck, bollock naked? And Matt, he was like, 
he is, he is. And we couldn't, like, we didn't know what to do because you want, all you want, it, your natural thing would be to just burst out laughing. <laughs> but it was so dumbfounded that we couldn't. And as soon as we'd noticed him, he kind of, like, acknowledged us, like, wiped his brow almost to say, like, phew, someone's caught us, put his clothes on, and left. <laughs> And only us, only we were the, the people that seemed to bat an eye. And this it was really, really strange. So, have yeah. you got have you got a stranger story than that? Or is that your strangest one on tour? Oh, there's been a few. Um, right, there's 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 a couple. I mean, there's the absolute day from hell the ball has uh, through me, Matty, and Ryan had in Spain. We're, we're trying not to talk about it. <laughs> Um, too much, but I, I suppose I can give a short version of that. So we were on tour in Spain, and uh, obviously it's massive. You're playing like like their gigs over there. You sometimes might your, your average start time for a gig will be like eleven o'clock. So it's like when when a gig might be finishing here, theirs is just starting. Yeah. Um, and there was one like some nights we went on at like one thirty in the morning. It was really strange. So you were getting in, you were getting back to the hotel, going to bed, like you know, really, really late. And over there, for some reason, most of the checkout times are like for hotels. The next day, are like nine, ten o'clock. So say if you were getting like, if if we were playing a gig, say between eleven and one, in the like eleven p.m. and one a.m., you were looking at like probably not even thinking about getting to sleep until like half four. And then you had to be up and out by like nine. So, it was, you know, you don't get a lot of sleep on these things, basically. Like, you, you've just got to kind of roll with it. Keep yourself inebriated to the point where you can get through it. Because um, we, we, we didn't have a driver. We just went out there, the three of us in a van with all of our gear and just did the whole thing. It might have been driving the whole, the whole tour. So, this night he hadn't had any sleep, basically, at all. And we had a big drive um, probably about five and a half six hours and we'd never heard of this place but we were going to <laughs> so we're trying to look it up we couldn't really find much about it anyway as we, it was getting more towards the north I think and as we got there we were like this this kind of this kind of be right and it was just this really strange like small town in like almost somewhere like Alston or somewhere like that, but smaller, but in Spain. And uh, I remember the first thing that happened when we got into this little town, we had to stop because there was a farmer who herded a whole load of sheep over the road. Um, so we get to the venue, and it's not a music venue. There's not a stage. There's, be- there's not even a PA system. There's no sound man. There's no nothing. It was just a little um, Brazil- Brazilian-style cafe. So... I'm trying to, no, we'll get there, not a single one of them speaks English, because it's, it's in a rural place, and uh, I'm trying to explain to them, like, I need to speak to, like, the promoter or whatever, so anyway, I get in touch with our agent, I try and tell him what's going on, he said, look, just try and do the gig, uh, and just we'll just try and get through it as best you can, see what you can do, um, we we taken a couple of little bits of spare equipment with us, uh, so luckily we had a little bit of stuff, but not enough. Uh, so I ended up having this massive argument with a with a promoter who called me unprofessional because I was telling them that the gig wasn't possible um, because there was nothing there for us to plug into and called me unprofessional. It was, it was, it was strange. Anyway, and then the before just before this happened, the uh, the the two the, the owners of the of the well, it was a restaurant. It was like a little restaurant bar thing. Uh, like a little cantina thing, really. They were lovely, but they just couldn't. We just couldn't communicate with them. So they'd gotten this Irish woman who lived in the town to come down, and she started talking. And she could see that Matty wasn't in a good way. By this point, Matty was like, you know, needed really needed some sleep. Um, so she offered him somewhere to sleep, and off Matt went. And I tried to sort everything out with the promoter and stuff. Me and Ryan just chilled out, had a couple of beers, and just tried to make the most of what was going on. I think we managed to get a hold of a little bit of equipment, so like I tried to do blah, 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 blah. Anyway. Um, and then the next thing, <laughs> whilst I'm setting everything up for this gig, 
Ryan goes over to try and wake Matt up, and then the next thing I get a I get a phone call off the, this Irish woman uh, saying that there was a problem. <laughs> and what she'd done was she put Matty in a flat that she owned that she rented out to her boyfriend, <laughs> whereas he wasn't in. He came home, thought, "What's going on? There's somebody in my bed." Uh, and apparently, he must have had his rent money out took his rent money and left the town but she flat out accused Matty and there was this there was this big fuffle and it was all very tense and very over the top and it was quite it was quite a scary day uh, and then once she realised that that wasn't the case she was like she was dead she was really apologetic and then at the end of the gig um, we were standing in the kitchen with t- two of the women that worked there and by this point there was two people there that did speak English um, and one of them offered us literally this this woman this last said and got this other last to translate that she wanted me Matty and Ryan <laughs> to have sex with her in this kitchen right there and then and we politely declined <laughs> <laughs> fucking Spain man I used to live there and I've seen some fucking weird shit over there I mind not be as weird as that time I seen that homeless guy having a wank on the street corner in Amsterdam. I didn't know what the fuck was going on with that. Yeah, I suppose he's got to do something, hasn't he? One of my um, because you borrowed my camera when you went on the la- one of the last tours in there. One of the best things I think to come back, not alone was it creepy as fuck watching the footage back because you guys would be like vlogging to me and just going, I bet you're watching this, and then shouting at like cats on the floor and all that and doing voiceovers. <laughs> Um, was w- when random Hillary got up and uh, is it after hours in France? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So w- said me and Matt said we'll uh, have to dig that out the archive because I don't even think that's ever been on the internet. I, I might have went up uh, Bruno at the time we owned the the venue might have put it up, but I don't think we ever put it up. But now was that was cool. Like, well, we've met some great people from through touring and. Uh, it's it's a shame. Obviously, we, we, we were actually meant to we were meant to be going out to, uh, France. We were meant to be in France uh, this week. But obviously, we can't we can't do that. Um, and we're meant to be on tour in Spain at the end of May, which looks like it's probably going to get rescheduled. So it's it's a bit, it's been a bit of a strange one. We're really looking forward to getting, getting away, yeah, yeah. making some new memories and that. Ah, uh, it's. Uh... I mean, you can only do so many gigs around here it's so much, can't you, really? Um, you are by far the most filmed band in the archive of My Lonely Tree footage, by far. Um, I think um, every time I watch the footage, I think this is some of that a click because I filmed it that many times. Um, remember that clip I randomly found and had to send you straight away and Turner was said it would speed it up when you played in Steph's? Like, what goes through your head when you fucking bust out a solo and your eyes roll back in your head? I mean, how does that happen? Um, I don't really know. I, 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 you, get, you get it, obviously, it's not just not just me. It happens with a lot of musicians. I think you just go to that uh, go to that place, really, you just where, like, you can be as, you can be expressive and it's, it's natural. You kind of you zone out from everything else and you go to, like, a... That's how. That's the best way I can describe it. You, you're not. You, you, you're there and you're in it. You're not thinking about anything else. It's like it doesn't matter what what else is going on. It's like it's all for what you what you're playing. It's it's, it's a bit of a. To be honest, it's a really hard feeling to describe. Um. Because I don't think there's anything else quite like it. It's just a really expressive. Uh, outlet, and then obviously when once you get into not just what you're playing, but like searching after tone and all that kind of stuff and using certain types of gear and, and then writing the music. There's, there's, there's a lot of aspects to it, but in terms of closing your eyes and playing loads of notes, it's just what comes out at the time when I go when I go to that place, I guess. <laughs> Matt was saying when he joined the band, you just emailed him. Did you, had you not met Matt before you uh, were looking for a replacement drummer? Well, met, funnily enough, I think the first time I ever met Matty was at, at one of those Raven gigs uh, way back in the day. So, I, and Matt, obviously, Matty was a little bit older than me at the time. Uh, so, he would have been 
was he, was he three years older than me, me and Ryan in school years. So, say we were like 14, 15, he would have been, you know, a, a fair, or he would have seemed a lot of, a fair bit older than us. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I had, I'd met him, but I hadn't seen or spoke to him in a long time, unless I'd been into the shop. Uh, and even then, I suppose, with the, I didn't know him well enough to stand and have a conversation with him, I guess. Uh, but no, I can't, I can't even remember how it came about. I think me and Ryan would talk because uh, we, we, we needed another drummer. And I can't I can't quite remember how it came about. I think I think I might have been Ryan who mentioned it. Um, and I was just like, yeah, I, like I, 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 You've gone into a tunnel. What's up? So you broke up a bit there. Am I, am I still here? Yeah, you're still here. Uh, so, I, I, I got in touch with them just because, at the time, basically because I remembered, obviously, seeing them play loads and whatnot. Uh, and at the time, I think what had happened, uh, how the situation had, had then ended up being that we didn't have a drummer, was pretty poorly timed and I think we need to, we had quite a lot coming up and it was like we need to get somebody in um, and we needed somebody reliable so I think when we, even when we first asked Matt it was kind of, I think from his point of view like I don't think he knew if he was like if, if he was that invested at the time really when he first came on board because we, we didn't know obviously he didn't know who we were yeah um, and it was so far removed from what Matty played but then it I and then it just it all clicked and then the rest was history I guess I think it's been a massive change I mean with Matt comes Steel Steel Town obviously Ryan now works there full time and obviously being able to record because the last two albums have been recorded in there as well haven't they so it was so it, it was just kind of meant to be wasn't it uh, it's strange it's strange how stuff pans out it's uh, obviously like all the all the best stuff we've, we've done really is uh, it's been been with Matt like just because of when he, when he when he joined everything that was when everything was kind of picking up and we were, we were touring a lot more and out of the country and stuff but now nah, it, it is strange how stuff comes about we ended up having that space to kind of just be creative and in each other's pockets all the time yeah where there's one there's the other two <laughs> that's it I um right we're going to get to the original HMV show. Um, so you, after we had been hanging out for a while and when Matty had joined the band, um, I would say we've been trying for years to make a, a legit music video. Um, we always just settle with just random bits and bobs. Um, we were going to do a video for Gone, weren't we? And um, we obviously straight away we had a speed bump with Gone when that the uh, the guy who had this we had this really good venue set out with all his furniture and stuff and then the guy was like oh I'm an extra and happy we were like oh shit here we go so we lost the venue so we ended up just filming it on a black and white backboard and again thinking about the song Gone I didn't think you could justify you playing live in a music video because you're like a live experience. Um, you've got three guys who can literally read each other's minds. I love the solos. I love the transitions into songs. And when it comes down to doing a video for you, it's more like, right, you kind of have to go for a story to visually short. Do you yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. And Gone kind of like was like, oh, well, it's got that solo bit in the middle and we can sort a story out. Not hating the fact that Gone's nearly seven minutes long. And um, uh, it's, I was gonna say it's a pretty long song. We, we should have picked a more sensible song. We we should have. Again, it was just like our oh, feel in the moment. Like, and that, that's where I was going for. Cause I I wanted to like bring out like a nice story and all that. And at the time, your life wasn't going great, and um, I unfortunately lost my granddaughter at the time. And when I came back to even think about doing the music video, I couldn't listen to the song anymore. The the song took on a total different. And credit to writing here. His, he's me thinking about one kind of story and then you s completely see a song from a different point of view and you guys were all class were like ah oh, fucking don't worry about the video get yourself right and then before you know it live in concert was there and I hadn't seen you I literally had a lot going on and I hadn't seen you and I got there at the Clooney that night 
And I was like, there's no one filming. And like, because you know what I mean? I had just been that distracted with like funerals and stuff. And live in concert was absolutely amazing album. Like live wise. It was, it was full of energy like. It was, I mean the whole night, I mean from my point of view, it was probably one of the first times I've been out. And after that, I think like, you know, because we'd like really try to get your album in HMV for release. And just given that opportunity to play live in HMV, which was quite unheard of at the time, um, because of the owners um, on a Saturday afternoon. I mean, what was that like playing live in the shop like that for the first time? It was it was strange. I, I remember it was it was strange because it was back when it was the 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 original Newcastle store. Yeah, and it was huge. Like on two floors and stuff, and it was it was it was a strange experience because we knew we weren't as loud as we usually would be, but because you were in that environment, it didn't matter how kind of much you lay you try to lay off the volume of, of through playing, yeah. it still felt really loud because of the context of where you were, uh, and then it was strange just seeing people like just like shopping for like two for ten DVDs and. Like just going about the business and then like slowly gathering a crowd of people. It was it was strange. It was a strange thing. Because I mean, the people are coming up the escalators and just like, what, what the fuck? <laughs> you know what I mean? No, they had nowhere <laughs> to go. And even I, I'd said to you, because um, we had talked before we went out, and I says I wasn't sure about um, what's the track you do, man, when you get everyone to sing along. Uh, and that's a, a, uh, a few, I think. I think at that point it would have been uh, them changes. Yeah, it was them changes. Yeah, and I was just like, I'm not really sure about that in the live song. And you were like, I'll just get you. And I was like, Well, you're the professional. And you fucking had people singing along live in the shop. You know what I mean? You just like uh, people like echoing in the back and that. So, but no, that was it. Was really good um, as well. So, but it was just mental. But like now, the transition. Um, you were the first guy I put on at HMV now in a new shop uh, in the shopping mall and I didn't think of anyone else to do the first one but you like what was that like because unlike the shop floor you had the window of the shopping mall and you just had people going past it was uh, no, it was it was cool it was it was it felt like a totally different experience to when we did it in, New, in Newcastle um, very different it was I don't know, I think that because it was kind of ele- where the way it was, we were elevated and it was kind of like we were on stage in HMV. Yeah, yeah. And it felt almost just like this really strange, like, social experiment for a gig. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> like, you were, like, you were, like you were still on stage, but the, the, the audience was like t- so far removed from what you were used to, uh, just to like look out at. Uh, but in in a, in a gay side store, it's, as you say, you've got that, you've got that. You've got that uh, that window where you've got everyone walking past. And it was it was cool. It was like a, it felt like more kind of of a showcase kind of thing. You know what I mean? It felt a bit a, a bit more legit uh, for some reason. I don't know don't know why, but it, it just felt a little bit more like a like oh this like do, do, you know what I mean? It, it didn't feel as it felt strange, but in a more kind of like what's going on kind of thing. thing. I, I can't, it's, it's a hard thing to explain that actually. Um, it's, it's not like, because, uh, sorry, I'm rustling some papers and notes. It's not like, okay. like people are coming to see you and sit down and see you. People are walking past the window going, what the fuck's going on here? It's, it, you know what I mean? And, uh, you, you know, like, because, like, you get people come up in the crowd around, but then, you like, you know what I mean? It's that passing exposure rather than someone paying to actually physically come and see you. No, definitely it was strange having that as well as with like the the fact that you were there was there was people who came to watch like as if it was a gig, uh, and then like people you knew and stuff who like who came to watch it and then all these people just like walking around it was it was, it was a strange one. I I mean I personally like like the uh, host and Kate of the shows I've seen somewhere there's been mosh pits and I went it's still a shop mind you know what I mean <laughs> <laughs> to fucking hell man. <laughs> but no, it's been like great um, to get the album and stuff in as I rustle back through. So, um, 
these two stories connect together so I basically had a spare ticket for John Carpenter in Manchester and I couldn't think of anyone better and also free at such short notice um, to go to Manchester <laughs> but you um, especially because we'll talk about scores in a minute I imagine but um, we blasted down to Manchester and I was I had the honour of the privilege of having you sing the entire Dangerous album to us on the way down or the way back um, what did you think of John Carpenter live? Because I mean, we had a great time, didn't we? Yeah, we were doing that. It was it was something else. It really was. It was uh, I think the the venue like was perfect as well. With it being like the old the old uh, church like chapel thing, I thought that was absolutely perfect. Um, and just just the it was the first time I'd like been to see somebody. Well, at least somebody as, as big as John Carpenter who'd done that with like where the band was was playing live, doing the score for like the, the film above. Yeah. As you were watching it, I thought it was uh, thought it was something else. Like it was class. But Good fun. but when I mean obviously it was a great night. The venue was class. I mean, um, on the, but we were talking about another music video then and using the courthouse, weren't we? And not long no, after, because uh, the courthouse was shut. And not long after that, because um, we kind of missed our opportunity to do it, but again, it, we've learned from our mistakes in the past. One day we'll do that big video, but um, Buskers is your brainchild, and I think what you've created, um, me and Matt talked about this. It's In Matt's words, was like, I've now become friends with people that I probably wouldn't have normally met any other social circle, and now, like... Every other Sunday, our livers are getting smaller and smaller because we're going out there and all the tables are jumping together. And you've pulled in some amazing talent. Um, what do you think about Buskers? Are you still enjoying it? And when it comes back eventually? No, def def definitely. It's, uh, I'm, it's something I'm quite passionate about because see, I do, I've done it elsewhere uh, before the courthouse as well. And it's, it's, it's just about hitting on that right kind of thing. But... For me, it's it's a great opportunity to watch people play. Yeah. Because usually every weekend when other people are gigging, I'm also gigging. So it's it's a nice opportunity to see people play and, and not have to, you know, if it's busy, not have to play at all myself because it's not about me. Uh, and also it gives, you know, young young people a, a chance to, to have somewhere to come and play and, and to hone the craft, which is massively important. Uh, and something that I don't take for granted uh, that I had that help growing up you know so I like to kind of return it where I can oh yeah I mean there's been some uh, like people just coming in and just that first exposure getting up um, but like stuff like Chris Justice I mean one of my favourite nights was him when he turned up with half a television <laughs> and just sort of plugged it in and then you know Liam Liam's just like very musical minded as well uh, but one of my uh, favourite nights, is what I can remember, <laughs> um, <laughs> was when you were gigging and Liam was hosting and you turned up and it was a fucking busy night, man. And I think Liam had been playing for a while and you just turned up from a gig and you were just like, ah, oh, finally, I've got a pint. And Liam was like, getting up, Mitch? And you were like, ah, oh, fuck. <laughs> And uh, you got up and you don't normally sing it on acoustic because you just picked up Liam's guitar and you did Michael Jackson give in to me and I, I was just like, it's one of the very few times I'll be filming and I'm not looking at my camera because I was just like, you've just done a gig, you've drove here, all you want is a pint and you can actually just, I mean, you mean, the whole room was just like, who the fuck's this guy? <laughs> just turned up. That is my <laughs> one of my favourite performances of you um, ever, I think. Um, well, there you go. Thank you. Just because uh, you were just like, oh, do to still do one. I was just like, fuck it, Elm. And then you did Knock on Wood, and like the thing is with Knock on Wood, I don't think we've ever released a clip of it because you're like, no, nah, it's not quite there. And you you like this, <laughs> and you'd be like, ah, oh, Mr. Tap there, Mr. Tap there. How did you even know you could fucking do that? I think it's with not with not on wood. I know that it's not my song, um, and it's. I think like if it's not played right to me, it, it's not the the song. It, you know, it's not right. But uh, I guess because it's not very well known, it's like people people dig it. But I uh, know I do like playing it. it I'd be really like playing it on Liam's guitar actually. 
Ah, uh, Liam's got it. Yeah, uh, Liam's. Uh, honestly, you got you put ten pence on Liam. He plays all night. He's fucking class. I mean, <laughs> what's um the worst show you've ever had? question to be honest that story that i was about in spain that was that was terrible um, yeah because it just kept on this turn down it was a tiled room um i think in the end we ended up having to pretty much abandon uh like really cutting the, the set short um because it was just it was terrible and it, it was just barely anybody it was really that was that in fact i'm gonna go with that i think that was the worst gig ever um what else i mean we've, 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 to be honest we've probably played a lot of kind of nondescript, forgettable gigs. Because um, I think every musician does, when they, especially when they're starting out in various different bands and stuff. But I think for the most part, you, you've got to have them to, to, to remember the really good ones. So, I, I, But I would definitely say that the, what, the first one that's brought to mind is that one in Spain. Right. Could be about, I've got that one. Got that one. Right. Um, Condog. Now you are and aren't a member of Condog. Um, you've been there all the time, though, haven't you? Um, I, well, the, the, in the, the early stuff, um, when Marty first started doing it, I I was uh, I was I was there in the thick of it doing it, like <laughs> not not ever under my own name. I mean. Um, it was really funny because uh, come back to my place, you do the solo in that. But that night you were actually gigging with uh, Groove Train, and right. you're not in the Monty's song, but you were like, right. And I tell you what, every time I watch that Monty's video, you never miss a beat. You're like, right, I'm in the zone, flat cap on, like literally chewing your brows off, like and like I think you're totally in the mood. And like Matt's like, oh come round me, we'll have this rave in the shed. I'll be the dorm, and I'm like, you know, like, we're not even drinking and we're doing this. And uh, that is, I mean, <laughs> just what a fucking night that was, mind. Uh, it was good fun, that. But every time you fun. look in the background of that video and everyone's busting raps, you just need to look for you because you'd be like dancing. And I don't even think you ever put your carrier bag down full of your cans. It's just like, right, no, I didn't, uh... <laughs> gonna take this acting thing serious. I'm all yours. Uh, it was good fun, that thing. Right, um, so a couple of last questions for you. Um, who would you like to do a duet with? Ooh. And you can only have one choice. Alive now. Well, I, I know that you would probably say, uh, well, I would, would you say a Prince if he was still alive? Yeah, probably. Um, oh, I don't know, that's a good question, that. Maybe it's John Mayer, uh, but it's, I think it's it's like an easy answer. Uh, nah, actually, no, D'Angelo. I'm going to go with D'Angelo. Your brown sugar. Uh, right, that's awesome. Um, so, you've been working on new music, um, and you've, uh -huh, you've, uh -huh. be, you've branched out, and you've went off and did... Um, I mean, I was lucky enough to hear some of this when we are uh, last had a, a, a drunken party when the sun's coming up and you're like, Christ. Um, and it's definitely funky 80s vibe. Um, are you going to do a full album? I am. Uh, yeah, I'm working on it as we speak. Um, yeah, I just decided to... It's, uh, I've not even just decided to. I think it just, it's just what's been coming out when I've been going to make music on my own. Uh, yeah. So I'm just when I'm writing and producing by myself, it's it's just what's coming out. So I just said, right, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with this aesthetic and uh, and go from there. But it's yeah, it's 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 obviously very it's very different from the band stuff. But it's uh, it's kind of what I was on about about the blues thing earlier on. Yeah, it's I, I think I've just got it's I've got the point where I'm kind of doing more of the stuff that I've wanted to do for a long time. Uh, as well as the blues stuff, because it's it's just it's always been there, and I think it's it's just a, it's it's now that time where I'm where it's coming out, and I'm I'm gonna put it out there, I guess. But yeah, very very eighties, very uh, gated reverbs and Lynn drums and all sorts, lots of synths. Very eighties inspired, I would say. No, it's good. <laughs> it's definitely good. 
Um, what is your favourite song you've recorded? Oh, oh that's, a, that's a good one. Um, to be honest, I really like. Uh, I really, I do really like the last two that I've done, uh, Human and Dirty Kink. Um, but just because, just because I think it's it's exciting, and I'm working on that as a project at the minute. Yeah. Um, oh, you've got us. You've got us stumped. I know you, you. You mentioned you mentioned this the other day as well. Uh, I think "Move On Over" is a really good song. I think that's. I think with that we, we wrote a really really good song. Uh, as a as a pop song, that was kind of different from the, the rest of the stuff we were doing as well. Because I like uh, uh, what you're living for. I think that's a really good song, and also as a fucking mint solo in the middle of it as well. Uh, what are you living for? That's a really hard question. I don't. I don't think I could. From the band stuff, I really don't think I could answer that. Matt's was uh, speak up. Matt was Matt's favorite one. And uh, speak up, it's a good one. It is an NS. So you're gonna see, right? Fav- we know what your favorite movie is, don't we? Yeah, well, I'd, I'd imagine so. I think anyone who knows who might be listening will probably know as well. But we'll, 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 do you want to reveal it? Well, is it a f- full-on sci-fi movie? Ellie Blade Runner, but also a yep. love for Moonwalker. Definitely. Um, Moonwalker holds a holds a big place in my heart. It's very, uh, very much part of my childhood. Definitely, and uh, at the time, I don't know if it still is, but it was the most successful home video ever. It fucking, uh, so I mean, it's a great montage, it, it, like, and then into some crazy story of with um, Joe Pesci, but visually <laughs> stunning, crazy. like. But it's just like I mean, remember that? I mean, remember that night we sat and played on the Mega Drive all night and drank a crate of beer, and like <laughs> sitting there playing Moonwalker. And what's the objective of Moonwalker? You go around find kids in cupboards and go, Michael, and he runs off and like you're like what the fuck? But the yeah, music for that eight bit as well, even the game, the eight bit audio of that was amazing. Yeah, it was. But apart it's from that, in the movie, it'll be Blade Runner, though, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. Absolute piece of art. Much love for the remit, uh, the sequel. Uh, when it first came out, when it first came out, I went to see it and I liked it, but I didn't think it was necessary. Yeah. Um, and I still kind of feel like that, but the more I've watched the second one, it, it, it's a fantastic film, even in its own right. Uh, yeah. As a modern sci-fi film, it's, it's fantastic. Visually but, stunning uh, the new one. Even the original though is still amazing. It looks amazing on Blu-ray. The, the original. The, the when I got I got the 4K uh, Blu-ray of of the original and it blew my mind. It absolutely blew my mind how it's it's because it was the last analog film ever made. So there's no digital effects in it whatsoever. Um, and it just blows my mind how good it looks. Like it really does look fantastic. I think it's just there's some for me. It's obviously the, I love the book as well that it's based on, um, but it's it's just from the from the ground up uh, everything about it: the cinematography, the soundtrack, the aesthetics, the art. Because a lot of the the backdrops were were meta paintings and stuff. It's it to me. It's just one big piece of like you know art, and and I, and I love absolutely love it. The whole very dear to me heart. It's meant, I mean, when you even get Dangerous Days. Dangerous Days is a fucking hell of a watch on its own as well. Yeah, it is. So as a kid, what was your favourite TV show? Ooh. Shit, I don't know. Probably. A lot of them. I used to watch a lot of Trouble. If you can remember Trouble. The, uh, the, the, like, the, the channel. And it was like, Fresh Prince, My Wife and Kids, Sister, Sister Keenan and Kel. All that kind of stuff, Moesha, uh, Brandy, <laughs> all that, like all that kind of stuff. Um, but to be honest, my favourite TV show growing up, I would probably have to say, would have been Friends, because of me age and like how I kind of how old I was when it when it was on, and I used to love it. Yeah, so I'd probably say Friends, which is really boring, 
sorry to anybody who's just had to hear that truth. So it was like how you met your mother, your, your, your new friend's void fella, was it? Um, do you know what it is? For a long time, I, I didn't watch it. I, I, I remember seeing this kind of like on uh, on Sky and stuff. My sister might have been, been watching it. Oh, I think it was my sister. My sister was watching it at some point and I was like seeing it in passing and thought like, oh, that looks crap. And then when I finally, I think it was when it first came on Netflix, when I finally, uh, when I finally watched it, I thought, actually, this is kind of good. <laughs> And I know to anybody who's like out there thinking, what what are you on about? It's a sitcom. <laughs> I'm fully aware of that, but it, it's it's like I think I've got a little because of Friends. I think I've, when when it's done well in Seinfeld and stuff like that, I think when it's done well, there's there's a there's a nice wholesome place for a sitcom. So yeah, no, nah, how about your mother's not not, not bad either. So, plans are for the rest of the year for you. You're going to finish your little solo album. Um, Matty has said that you guys are recording as a band. We are. We are indeed. Obviously, we're doing it for anyone listening and worried for uh, our safety and the safety of others. We are not doing it uh, all in the same room. Thanks to the powers of technology, we're doing it all remote. So, Matt's recorded his drums. Uh, Ryan's recorded his bass and I'm, I've recorded all my parts and we're just putting it together and producing it through just messages back and forth you know yeah. just a, which I think a lot of people are doing now and I think for depending on how long this goes on I think it's the only way people will be making music if it's not by themselves but yeah, yeah, so we're, it, yeah. we're, we're, we're re- recording with the band uh, and I've got my solo project um, which will be de- which will definitely be finished before the end of the year um, hopefully, hopefully, well before then. Uh, just trying to use all the all the time I've got to to be creative. It's it's been strange because it's 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 uh, for me it's been like well this is strange and it's not really where I, it's not how I wanted things to be. Yeah. In terms of like the restrictions of being able to do stuff because I'm not really the type of person who just sits in the house all the time. It, 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 I need to be out doing stuff and socialising and. Uh, keeping my mind active and you know but it, it's been it's kind of it's kind of strange because it's this whole like well how long is this going to last but actually I'm kind of enjoying it because I'm getting so much done and it's forcing us to use all my time to be creative and, and not be distracted by other stuff so it's a strange one um, hopefully we'll all come through with flying colours man and I definitely think uh, your, your solo album needs a bright cosmic pink vinyl Especially the package you've been going for. Well, I've been Stephen Monkey Mason. This has been branching out. An absolutely amazing guest there with Mitch, who was, uh, as he's just said there, has new music coming out. Um, You've got four studio albums and a live album. Is that correct? Yeah, yes, yes. This time around, Burning Bridges, Let Go in Another World. Um, Yeah, live concert, that's right. Live concert, yeah. And as I say, you can get them on, they're all online, they're on Apple Music, Spotify and everything, aren't they? Yeah, everything's, everything's up there for, for the world to see. It is. But, yeah. Merch as well. So thanks for listening, everyone, and we'll see you next time. Cheers, guys. Thank you.